Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this lecture. It's been a pleasure for you to wake up this morning in such a sunny day, right? And come to the lecture. Today we will focus on the very first lecture of this course. As you know, it's called International Economics and Development Studies. So it has a part of international economics, about international economics, and a part about development studies. They're not exactly the same thing, and I would say that the most important aspect is that the perspective under which things are studied are a bit different. However, in both cases, both for the international economics point of view and the development studies point of view, What's important is that they deal with some very, very fundamental and I would say big questions, such as why are some nations richer than, than others? Um, why is quality of life better in some places rather than others? And when you see the red uh, word, it means it's a keyword. Okay? So it's a keyword, so richer or quality of life, but not the same thing. And we will discuss over the course of this module why they are different, okay? and also why they require, for instance, different measurements. Can a poor country improve its wealth and quality of life? And if so, how? What are the policies, for instance, that can be undertaken to improve a country's situations? What about international exchanges? Of course, these are fundamental. Exchanges of goods, money, capital, people, though we won't go that much into detail as to migration, but for everything else, exchanges of goods and services or capital between countries. Are they useful uh, to improve a country's situation? And we will ask ourselves, are they useful for whom or under what circumstances? Okay. So, um, and as I mentioned last time, actually, if you think about it, for those of you that already took a history of economic thought course, these are some of the basic questions that the economic discipline has put at the center of its studies since the very beginning. Okay. So they are common. Um, in many respects, to all of these fields. But as I know that many of you didn't take any course in history of economic thought, I said we would briefly have an overview, okay, briefly have an overview of the different points of view of very, very influential scholars. So this is what we're going to do today. And I'll try to stress that they have sometimes very immediate implications in terms of international exchanges or policy suggestions for international exchanges. They, they had a view on free trade, for instance, or protectionism. Um, so for instance, these questions are common to political economy, development economics, uh, international economics, industrial economics, sometimes microeconomics, macroeconomics, very, very fun fundamental questions. These are the scholars that we will briefly touch. And I mentioned um, the books that I think are very, very important. So at least you should be aware that these exist, okay? And be able to place them somewhere in history, roughly, okay? Um, of course, Adam Smith, um, with two important books. One is The Theory of Moral Sentiments. It's a bit less known than the at least to economists, then the other one that it's called an inquiry into the nature and the causes of the wealth of nations, okay? Um, the second one is very famous, it's called the wealth of nations and I'm sure that you've all heard about it. Have you heard about it? Yes, all of you? Okay, that's good. Then we have David Ricardo on the principle of political economy and taxation. Then Karl Marx, Das Kapital, a critique to political economy. Then we have Alfred Marshall with two books in particular I want to mention. One is Principle of Economics and the other one is Industry and Trade. And then the last one is Keynes, okay. The Economic Consequences of the Peace is one of the books and then the very, very famous one, The General Theory on, of Employment, Interest and Money, okay. We will go briefly, have an overview of these scholars and 
uh, their basic intuitions and try to understand that what we today think about international exchanges, free trade uh, or trade policies are still influenced by the thought of these, of these scholars. Now, what do you know about Adam Smith? <laughs> Come on. Anyone remembers anything about him? Don't be shy. Yes? She's saying he placed a lot of importance to workers in the economy. Yes, okay, so she's suggesting. What's important about Adam Smith, he started talking about economy, economic, economic studies has a science on, of its own, okay? Yes, exactly. So he was mentioning two important contributions that Adam Smith gave. One is the invisible hand concept, and which is normally the one that everyone remembers, okay, the most famous one. The second one is mentioning, which we could argue is even more important, is an understanding about the concept of the division of labor, okay? Uh, and we will come back to this in a moment. Yes, that's important. First of all, let us think that Adam Smith was first studying and teaching moral philosophy, okay? And then it's true, he, started, he was studying also Newton's mechanic and was trying to apply the same kind of scientific method to the study of economy and society, okay? That's, that's why we, we say that, in fact, we think about Adam Smith as, as at least one of the founders of the economic discipline as a standalone discipline, okay? But coming from moral philosophy. And it's important the term political, political comes from polity or polis, means referring to a community of people. So the set of rules governing a community of people. Okay? So you understand that it's quite clear why it comes from the moral philosophy it has to do also with things such as what's good, what's right or wrong when you try to manage a community of people. Okay? So he was observing the Industrial Revolution, which was a shift actually from a system to a completely different one, basically from a feudal system to a market economy, okay? And the difference, um, so to a capitalist system and a so-called market economy, um, where market is intended as an institution, so the set of rules where people um, can exchange property, property rights, basically. So equal individuals uh, are free to exchange property rights. It's a different system than the previous one, of course, as you understand it. Uh, and important to Adam Smith's studies is that at the center of these studies are, as he said, the organization of labor within a factory but also the social organization of labor within a society. And the two things are kept together. That's why it's called political economy, because the two sides are studied together. Uh, and he observed, of course, that a new social class was emerging, the capitalist class, or industrial bourgeoisie, as you want to call it. Um, what is very different from the previous feudal system is that the position of each person in a society is meant to depend upon one's own ability. Okay? What ability? Ability to organize labor, for instance, entrepreneurial ability. Okay? That's what puts you in a specific position in a society. Not because of your dynasty or not because you're the son of, an, of a noble person, but because of your ability. That's the fundamental change that he was trying to describe, at least, and to some extent, okay, okay. Um, but for this to happen and to work, so basically he was suggesting there's no need to fear. That's the metaphor of the invisible hand. There's no need to fear a system in which people are free to exchange property rights, the system will not collapse and it will actually produce a desirable solution for everyone, provided that there's a shared system of rules and values and a system of equal rights. That's when it works. That's why there was the theory of moral sentiments before the, um, 
um, the wealth of nations. Okay. Now, of course, you see the difference between the, so the two systems. And if we have time, we come back to this later on. Um, this was also possible because before the Industrial Revolution, there had been a political revolution. And also, to some extent, that because there, were, there had been scientific revolutions, which basically changed the way in which people thought about the universe. So they were also ready to change the way they thought about society and the economy. Okay. But we'll come back to this later if we can. Now, the, coming to the fundamental questions, why are some nations richer than others? Basically, the, the answer, according to Adam Smith, was due to the division of labor and uh, the extent of the market. These are two concepts that are very much useful today, if you think about it. I'll give you an example in a minute. What is this concept? These are the two bits where Smith talks about division of labor and extent of the market. The greatest improvement in the productive powers of labor and the, great, the greater part of the skill, dexterity, and judgment seem to have been the effects of the division of labor. As it is the power of exchanging that gives occasion to the division of labor, so the extent of this division must always be limited by the extent of that power, or in other words, by the extent of the market. What does it mean? <laughs> what does it mean? Well, basically, he's observing the pin factory, how it's organized, the pin factory, and he observes that, of course, to realize a single pin, you need several phases. Okay? You need to cut the material, you need to sharpen it, Several phases, okay. A single person on its own can do probably 20 pins per day. But then if you organize labor in a different way within a factory, you can come up to 4,000 pins per each person. That's what your colleague is saying, productivity skyrockets. Productivity really goes up just because you are organizing labor in a different way. And of course, you have machinery, and you are, you are organizing both capital and labor, but division of labor. That's the improvement in the productive powers of labor, improvement in productivity, is the effect of the division of labor. Okay? Then the question is, once you, have, once you come up to 4,000 pins per worker, what do you do with all those pins? Okay? nothing if you cannot sell them. Okay. So you need to have the power of exchanging, possibilities of exchanging goods and services, so you need to have a market for those goods and services. Or in other words, there has to be a demand. If you are living in a small town in the middle uh, of the UK, um, in the middle of nowhere in the UK, basically, where there's no city or in the countryside, and that's your market, there's no way you're going to sell those 4,000 pins. You need to have an extent of the market that allows you to sell those pins, which means having people be able to exchange in goods and services, having a demand for those goods and services. So the extent of the market, it's limiting that possibility to benefit from increased productivity. If there's no demand, there's no occasion for the division of labor. Okay. Now, there's still very helpful insight because can you think of an example of an increase in the extent of the market? What would be an example of a sudden increase of the extent of the market? Yes, for instance, extending your market to another country. Okay. Okay, so one suggestion is when you start producing and goods become cheaper, all of a sudden all people can acquire the goods, those goods and services. Think about China joining the WTO and growing fast. That's an increase in the extent of the market because it's a big, big, big market opening up. And globalization in general can be seen as an increase in the extent of the market. Okay? So possibilities to change change goods and services, which gives occasion to the division of labor. Okay? To some extent, you can think, think about also industrial clusters, whole cities and towns specializing 
okay, in one single product and selling it to the rest of the world. It's a different point of view. It's not the single factory, it's the city, but still the issue is division of labor and extent of the market. So still very helpful insight, okay? We can apply this even at a different scale, not the single factory, but a city, for instance, or in, in industrial clusters with division of labor inside and extent of the market. Now, of course, the metaphor of the inv invisible hand has to be understood in that specific historical context, okay? So he was kind of, as I said, advocating for this change, suggesting that the system would not collapse and that the outcomes could be desirable if you let people free to engage, let entrepreneurial capacity to emerge, and let people free to exchange goods and services among them, themselves. Um, because it was kind of trying to overcome the old feudal system and come into a different organization of society and production. What do you think are the implications of this idea of division of labor and extent of the market, and of course the invisible hand, um, in terms of trade policies, for instance, or suggestions in terms of international exchanges? Yes, it might, it might imply that buying things from abroad might be less costly than producing them by yourself. We'll come that back to these in a minute. But when I say policy implication, I'm thinking if he had to suggest to the policy maker what to do in terms of trade policy or international exchanges, what would be the suggestion? Okay, don't worry, we will come to 2008. <laughs> this was the, yes, it's called, it's normally thought of as laissez-faire policy. So don't worry, the market will adjust on its own. Don't need to have government intervention. Though, actually, Smith didn't say that government only needed to defend people and protect rights. He was an advocate of um, um, public education as well. So there was a role also for government to to engage in public education. But for sure, of course, thinking about the time, it has a different meaning than thinking about this today. Okay, you have to understand we're back in the Industrial Revolution. Laissez-faire, so basically the policy suggestion in terms of international exchanges would be let international exchanges happen. Okay, it's not a problem. And free trade would be the policy suggestion. Okay, so that free trade would be advantages for countries. Now, of course, think about the situation. It was the Great Britain, uh, the, um, the, the time, at the time the UK was the first industrialized power. So the ability of that country to produce goods and services was, was different from that of other countries. David Ricardo became famous for his um, contribution to the labor value theory, but today we're gonna concentrate on its contribution to the concept of comparative advantage. So basically what Ricardo was suggesting is that there is space for all countries to take part to this free trade game, let's call it like this. A anyone can take part and anyone can benefit in a win-win situation. The industrialized countries or the less industrialized countries, they can all take part, provided that they specialize in the production where they have a comparative advantage. Okay? Even though Great Britain might have an absolute advantage, might be better at producing everything, given the cost structure and given its endowments. However, if, if countries specialize in productions where they have a comparative advantage, they can exchange goods and services. Great Britain can give up some of the productions and leave some of these production to other countries. Comparative advantage, in order to understand where you have a comparative advantage, you have to think in terms of opportunity costs. Okay? It's where you have the lowest opportunity costs in giving up some production. Don't worry, because we will come to, these are all things that we will discuss later on in the course. 
what's important is to understand that the importance of comparative advantage concept it, it's that it gives the occasion to everyone to take part to the game in international exchanges. And also that subsequent developments in international economics, what it's normally thought of as international economics and trade policy and trade theory, such as the Hicciroli model, which is one of the most famous one in international economics, build upon this, this idea of comparative advantage. They've built upon it okay, over the years. Now, of course, there was another influential economist and political activist and philosopher, um, Karl Marx, which also was observing what was happening throughout the Industrial Revolution and actually observing that, from his point of view, what was happening was the emergence of actually two classes. One was the capitalist class, okay? The other one was the working class or urban pro proletariat, as you want to call it. And that somehow this second one was also asking for more power and voice. And that what, according to Adam Smith, was a change from a vertical structure of the society, the feudal system, into a horizontal structure of the society where people could exchange property rights. Actually, according to Marx, again, we would end up in a capitalist system into a vertical organization of society still, because you would have a capitalist class on top and the working class at the bottom. Um, so basically, he concentrated on, his studies concentrated on the conflict between these two cl classes and suggesting that this conflict between the two classes was an intrinsic feature of capitalism, okay, an intrinsic feature. And the only way to manage this conflict would be to guarantee growth, never-ending growth on a global scale, okay? But that at the same time, this wouldn't be possible and that then the socialist revolution was the solution. And because capitalism necessarily had to become imperialism, as somebody was mentioning, trying to sell okay, goods and services in a different country, this would have turned into imperialism in Marx's view, and that the, the proletarian revolution had to become international. Um, what do you think are the implications in, for the poorer nations? If this is a view, what do you think is the possibility for poorer nations? Is there a possibility to truly develop in this system or not? Unless through a revolution. Well, the implication is that it's very difficult, if not impossible, for poor countries to develop themselves in, in this <coughs> capitalist system. And we will go back to this when we study the different school of thought in development economics. We will go back to also the dependency theory and um, these kind of conclusions, okay? And we will discuss also whether you think it's possible in reality. So at some point, um, these scholars were observing that, in fact, um, the Industrial Revolution uh, was underlying a sort of double conflict. On the one hand, an internal conflict between the two classes, and on the external from the external point of view, a conflict between industrialized nations and the poorer ones, the so-called latecomers. And then you see, you start here start some of the bigger questions. What does a latecomer do? A country that comes in late, meaning after somebody else has already industrialized. By definition, everyone but Great Britain is a latecomer. Germany was a latecomer, America was a latecomer, and then uh, now, today, we have different latecomers, okay? People that, uh, countries that still have to industrialize. Then we have another important, I would say, milestone in the history of economic thought, okay. um, which is Alfred Marshall, 1842-1924. Here we talk about the neoclassical revolution or marginalist revolution. Have you ever heard this term before? 
Yes, only those that have taken history of economic thought, right? <laughs> Everyone else. Do you know what the marginalist revolution is? No. Okay. Do you remember we said, oh, one thing, one important thing, if you go back to the slides that we've seen so far, think about Marx, think about Smith. They all had in common that they treated the study of the economy as political economy. Do you see that combination? Even though they came to different conclusions, okay? But it was political economy because it was talking about social organization of the economy and keeping together a study of the society and the study of the economic systems, okay? Now, when we talk about the marginalist revolution or neoclassical revolution, we mark, we mean to mark a shift from political economy to what it's called economics, or, um, yeah, economics. And uh, we normally think about Alfred Marshall as the first one that initiated this, this, this change um, with principle of economics. The famous book is Principle of Economics. What did he explain in Principle of Economics? Do you know? If I now draw a graph with a supply and demand, would you recognize it? Because you've done microeconomics, all of you, okay. Now that's what he was explaining in Principle of Economics. That's where it comes from, okay. <clears throat> So basically, explaining, um, trying to understand markets through the laws of supply and demand, okay? A very, very important step into the, in, for economics um, for many reasons. What's the characteristic of the supply and demand graph? Of course, you know how it works. When they cross, you have a quantity and a price, the equilibrium quantity and the price. But think about the difference between the political economy approach. What's the difference? It doesn't involve the state. Okay, that's one point. What else does it not involve? Classes, okay. Yes, I mean, it's individual X or company X. You don't need to know where it lives. It's not in the Industrial Revolution. It's everywhere, basically. It's universal. So that person, the consumer that makes his choice, or the company that decides how much to produce, that's that kind of choice, it's equal everywhere and in any time, okay? At any time and everywhere in the world. So it doesn't imply the political aspect of the discussion. It's abstract in a sense and universal at the same time because we think that anyone chooses. The consumers all make the choice in the same way and companies all reason in a similar way when making those choices. And basically, so economics gradually becomes the science that studies the choice of a different options of a representative agent, as I said, individual X or company X. We don't need to know the name, we don't need to know where they live, we don't need to know in what time in history they are. Um, and that takes this choice in a rational way, okay? And normally at the margin, it's a marginal choice. If you go back into your studies of microeconomics, I'm sure that you've discussed a lot about marginal costs, marginal revenues, and um, uh, the choice made, taking into account marginal costs and marginal revenues, okay? That's why it's called marginalist revolutions, because the important choice are those at the margin, okay? And that's why you have the toolkit for economics to understand how people or how companies make the, their choice. And in a different book, so in subsequent times, in the different books, he, he discusses about colonialism, trade, and also social in, in organization of production within clusters. So he was also studying industrial clusters, gave important contributions to industrial economics, but in a different book. So even we can think about it, really the separation between the two. Of course, he was trained 
we have to remember also sometimes it's useful to go back also to the, the background of these scholars. He was trained as a mathematician, so he had a natural um, inclination towards using mathematics as a language, okay? Although he was warning that mathematics should not become um, the essence of the study of economics, okay? It should be useful as an analytical tool, but then when you had to transfer the concept to everyone, even to the normal person, even to the non-expert, you should use words and keep the mathematics aside, okay? Otherwise, it would be difficult for everyone to understand. Okay? He was very um, conscious on this, on this point. What about trade? What was, their, what was his um, attitude toward trades? We could say it was, he had a pragmatic approach, okay? So generally, in favor of free trade, but in, but in a pragmatic way, he could also understand that in some circumstances, for instance, for the late comers, in certain conditions, limiting free trade could be useful in very specific circumstances. So he, was not, he didn't have an ideological, let's say, approach towards free trade. It's free trade always and ever. It depends in some circumstances, so he tried to be more pragmatic on this point of view. Now, of course, you see that the political aspect is taken aside. He wanted, he had the, the ambition of giving a toolkit for economics to be more scientific, okay, and, and to resemble natural sciences more than social sciences. That's why also he was um, stressing this in principle of economics. And also, he, was, he had the ambition to try to separate the positive analysis from the normative one. Now, what's the difference between positive analysis and normative analysis? What, what, what are the to approach? So, what's your name again? Ezra. Ezra says positive analysis asks what's the problem, and normative analysis tries to give a solution. Positive analysis is that he says positive analysis is a description, normative analysis in an, is an opinion. Okay, so that's the difference basically is positive analysis tries to describe a phenomenon, okay, asks the kind of, tries to answer to these kind of questions. What happens if you, write, if you raise interest rates? What happens to savings? Okay, try to describe the phenomenon. Normative analysis tries to suggest what should be done. Okay. So, is it a good idea to rise interest rates in this moment in history? That's kind of a normative question. Okay. So the ambition is to make economics a science free from value judgments, okay? and, and concentrate more on the positive side of economics that, rather than the normative point of view. That was something that Marshall was... Um, trying to, to do, though, of course, many, many scholars later on discussed whether it is really possible to be free from value judgments, okay? But it's important to, to, take, to remember this, to, the, the difference between positive analysis and normative analysis, okay? That's something that is very useful for, um, well, I would say in your future career, always try to remember the two as a separate, not always that separate, but for sure, description and the policy suggestions, for instance, or what we call policy implications. Now then, coming to the last one of our brief overview, we have another revolution. Even the, with the contributes of uh, Keynes, we talk about Keynesian revolution, okay? say revolution because it's a completely different set of perspectives, explanations on how economic phenomenon work, different theory and different policy implications. Okay. Um, and here we have two books that are important. The first one is the economic consequences of the peace. Okay. After World War I, he was 
discussing about the peace process at the end of World War I, suggesting that it was badly, being badly managed. Okay. Um, and it was suggesting that it was a mistake to let defeated nations pay for the war damages and that somehow counterintuitively after the war you should help defeated nations recovering because if you don't do it and if you put too much pressure on defeated nations you will get in even bigger troubles okay those and which is actually what happened so it was suggesting that the bad management of the peace process would pave the way for um, totalitarian regimes that then came about, especially in Germany, because he was stressing that if you don't help defeated nations, they will get into even more economic trouble and that then in turn, these will become social and political, will turn into social and political instability. Okay. He was a, an economist, and but very, very active in terms of policy making, always active in suggesting he held positions, very important positions, um, both at the end of World War I and at the end of World War II in suggesting policymakers what to do. And he had this view about um, how to deal with the peace process, but they were not... Um, they didn't come through in the policy... In the policy um, process, okay. Then he published the general theory, that's the most famous one. General theory of employment, interest and money in 1936. And he stresses, that's, what, that's then how, why we say it's a revolution, because he was stressing that he called it general because according to his point of view, the mainstream neoclassical revolution that came before, which became mainstream because at that time Marshall studies were very, very, well, in fact, were the mainstream economics and many textbooks were based upon Marshall understanding of the markets. And he was suggesting that case that we are studying as if it was the universal important one, which is basically built upon the perfect competition, okay? That setting that you know from microeconomics has perfect competition has the reference model, okay? Um, that's the special case. So Keynes was explaining at the beginning of the general theory, we're studying actually the special case. I don't think that that's the general case, so I'm calling this theory general because I wanted to make it clear that we are concentrating on a special case. And that actually, markets, if they're let free to operate without any rules, they get into failures, okay? That's what, of course, for microeconomics, you know that there are market failures, and he was stressing somehow that market failures are the rule, not the, excep not, not the exception, okay? And also with other scholars that gave contribution to industrial economics, also trained in Cambridge and that were working with Keynes, suggested that, okay, perfect competition is, is the exception, actually. Normally, markets are structured around different structure. If it's not perfect competition, it's what? Imperfect competition, which means? <laughs> Plant? I'm saying, I'm talking about the market structure. So if a market is not structured, it doesn't work as a perfectly competitive market. It's not perfect competition. What else can it be? A monopoly or oligopoly or monopsony? Monopolistic competition, okay. So, and that these are the rules actually. So it's, so even when you think about how companies decide their prices, in monopolistic competition or oligopoly, or even so, more so monopoly, they're not price takers, okay? They have some market power. And this also has a meaning for the general functioning of the economy, okay? So he was trying to um, 
to link this microeconomic bit, but focusing not on the exception, he said, but on the, the more general situations, okay? And of course, um, of course, he was studying this. He was very much stressed on to understanding the Great Depression, okay? Because if you think about it, according to the, the mainstream view, markets would adjust quite automatically. And even if you had a crisis, you, you should see market adjusting quite automatically. But then the Great Depression didn't work like that. He was observing persistent unemployment. So he tried to, he was trying from the theoretical point of view to understand how can it be that we have persistent unemployment. There must be something that doesn't work as the previous theory is suggesting on that markets adjust and, and that the laws of demand and offer are enough to make markets adjust, okay? There's something that we're not capturing. That's what the general theory was about, trying to explain, for instance, why um, wages are t sticky and do not adjust immediately and also trying to understand um, the impact of monetary policy on the economy. Okay. But he wanted to do so basically to understand unemployment. Why unemployment was something that could not be resolved so easily after the Great Depression. And there must be something wrong in the theory he was suggesting. Okay. And also, you know, he gave the counterintuitive intuition, that counterintuitive solution that in a crisis time, actually, a state should intervene and spend more instead of less during a crisis time. Why? Because you needed a super partis institution that would basically give confidence, okay? Change agents' expectations on the future, okay? And then, of course, for instance, with the New Deal, that's an example of a kind of policy that follows these suggestions. You can invest with, through public spending and that activates a demand, okay? Because people then are working into the uh, public investment and getting higher income and through higher income increase the demand for more, more goods and services. And, and it was basically about also changing the expectations. And of course, he had a different views about how individuals make their choice. He didn't quite believe in the rational idea of rational choices, but he, called, he stressed, for instance, the concept of animal spirits, especially thinking about financial markets and how the crisis came about in 1929. Thinking about financial markets, there was an irrational exuberance, he says, the irrational exuberance. So people investing not in a very rational way. Okay. So one solution to the market failures is, is through government intervention, basically. Markets do fail and you need government to intervene. Okay. I would say that also he had kind of a pragmatic approach, still was very conscious to not embrace free trade to core, that's it, but try to be more pragmatic. So free trade, yes, it can benefit everyone that it's engaged in free trade, but we must be aware there are also, uh, there can be negative consequences. In particular, he was very, very, um, he was, I would say, his attention went more onto trade imbalances. So he was cautious in warning against trade imbalances. You can have free trade, but make sure that countries do not run high trade imbalances, okay? High trade deficits, for instance, or trade surpluses. When they get too high, that can be a problem. So he was very much focused on trade imbalances Okay, um, and that you should try to limit those trade imbalances. When we come to, after this brief, brief overview, so we ended up with um, the 
general theory, 1936, okay, that's where we ended. We come to this time here, you see, it's called, in 1944, what the economic historian Obsborn calls the age of catastrophe. No wonder why, okay, the age of catastrophe. After two world wars, okay, one of the darkest periods of our, of our times, so age of catastrophe. 1994, it's a very, very significant year. Um, and very much connected to Keynes and also to his ideas on free trade. What happened in 1944, among other things? Now, you see that we are observing different, in this graph here, you are observing different phases of, of globalization, okay? You have an index here that it's called Trade Openness Index, and it's trying to capture the volume of trade, so imports and exports summed up together over GDP. Okay, at the global level. What is it that you, not that you notice first? This is imports and exports over GDP for, at the global level. What is it that you're noticing? What well, catches your eyes? Can be even more than one thing, okay. Yes, it went up very quickly after 45, that's one thing. What else? Yeah. Okay, the slowest point in 1944, yes. What else? There straight, straight lines before, okay. We don't have probably data, okay, data is like, we can get trend data. The lines are interesting because they tell you that even if we, if we go back in time, and of course, also back in history, there were periods where exchanges in goods and services happened, did take place, but the volume, volumes are by no way comparable to those of today, okay? Even if you think about it, okay, there was the new Silk Road at some time, but think about the speed and the volumes of goods and services that could be traded back then, so they're not comparable to those of today. So yes, one point, good point is, 44 is the slowest, the lowest point, and then it started increasing. We can spot different phases of this increase in globalization um, measured. This is a proxy, okay? Just measuring trade in goods and services is a proxy. Well, the other thing is that we are at the peak, okay? We never experienced anything like that in recent history, such a peak in terms of volume of trade, okay? So you understand that this means that institutions governing globalization need, need a change, uh, even just because for the simple fact that we haven't experienced such an integration in terms of volumes of trade before, okay? We're at the peak, 60%. So if we go back in the 70s, we, we were around 20%. Okay, of trade volumes in terms of GDP. It means that 60% of what we produce is actually exchanged, more than a half. And it never happened before, okay? So we need to think about the rules that govern these exchanges, okay? This thinking about the rules that govern these exchanges, actually, it's not new. In 1944, exactly, after the end of World War II, at some point the world felt the need to think about the rules that should govern international exchanges. Now during the, during the two world wars, exchanges went down because world economy is by definition not based on exchanges, okay? You, you don't trade goods and services while you're, you're at war with someone, okay? So that's why exchanges go down, 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 up to the end of World War II. And then at the end of World War II, countries felt the need to set the rules that basically would prevent another war. That was the issue at stake. They, they wanted to prevent another world war. So they had to think about a place where to discuss political issues, global political issues, the United Nations, 
and they needed a set of rules to govern the economy in a way that would prevent another war. Okay, so when did that happen? Where? The set of rules governing the next phase of globalization, 1944. Bretton Woods, yes. Bretton Woods Conference, okay, Bretton Woods Conference. That was very important because basically it set the rules for the next phase of globalization, okay, which basically remained so until the 70s and then slightly changed, okay. Mm. What do you remember about Bretton Woods? It's important because when you look at that conference, those rules were based upon what they believed was the relevant economic theory, the relevant economic theory to explain even exchanges between countries and to provide the correct policy suggestions to policymakers to set the rules for governing exchanges across countries. Uh, so, in the Bretton Woods Conference, what is it that countries decided? The architecture of economic relations at the global level. So, some institutions were funded at the Bretton Woods Conference. Do you remember which ones? Uh, the World Trade Organization. Yes, the, the, it, the World Trade Organization is saying uh, it was the General Agreement on Trade and Tariffs, which then became the WTO. Okay, that's true. General Agreement on Trade and tar Tariffs, with ba which basically was um, paving the way for free trade, free trade across countries. Okay. The World Bank. Okay. The World Bank. The International Monetary Fund. You've heard about it, right? Yes, you have. <laughs> what else? What about exchange rates between currencies? Yes, exactly. So basically, these are the pillars at the Bretton Woods Conference. The pillars that came out from the discussions at the Bretton Woods Conference, the architecture that was governing the next phase of globalization based upon four pillars. One, a fixed exchange rate system with the dollar as a reference currency. So other currencies would be pegged against the dollar, okay? fixed against the dollar. The International Monetary Fund, which would help countries dealing with financial instabilities, providing short-term loans, okay, and monitor over monetary policies, okay, basically to avoid hyperinflations and, and trying to deal with macroeconomic stabilities, short-term loans. Okay. The World Bank was meant to provide long-term long -term loans, especially to poorer countries, helping to help them in their industrial development process, and then the general agreement on trade and tariffs, opening international trade, hmm? which then became WTO. You see, it's a different setting of rules with respect to World War I. There's a bank trying to help poorer nations. There's an international monetary fund dealing with macroeconomic instability. Fixed exchange rate regimes, which would um, promote exchanges between countries, okay? Taking out the risk of a currency, um, fluctuations in currencies, um, and the WTO, and the WTO. You know that Keynes was part of this, right? He was the delegate for the United Kingdom. So he, his views were really put forward in this discussion and in this debate, though it, he had a different vision. It didn't come out exactly as he envisaged because there was a discussion between the United States and the delegate was Harry Dexter White and the, and the United Kingdom and the delegate was Keynes. Particularly, he was stressed with the idea that it was a mistake to fix all other currencies with a real currency of a real country. So using the dollar as a reference currencies 
could be a mistake. He was advocating for creating a new currency, not a real one, only a virtual one, and, and using that for international, for international exchanges and also for fixing the, 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 the exchange rates, right? Because if anything happened to the reference country or the reference currencies, the whole system could collapse, okay, if, if anything went wrong with the economy of the reference country, okay? And the system did actually a breakup in the, in the 70s, okay? And, and then they had to shift to a flexible exchange rate regimes, okay? And also he was suggesting, which did not pass, that you should have a sort of clearing union, a super parties, again, institutions, that would make sure that countries didn't run too high trade deficits or too high trade surpluses. He suggested that you should control trade deficits or trade surpluses, okay, and the imbalances. But his views were not, didn't completely pass, but he was very influential in, in this whole architecture, okay. Now, if you go back, and look at the graph, actually, you see that international exchanges soon after started growing, but not that much, actually. The speed was much higher than, we had to wait until 1970s to see the next wave of increase in exchanges, okay. But they started growing, growing up, 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 and then we had the stop, of course, there are at least two stops, beginning of the 70s and end of the 70s. Why? Yes, two oil shocks, okay. And recessions that came about after the two oil shocks, which stopped also trade exchanges. And then again, a sharp increase. And I would say that a new phase also begins. If you look at the rates, I didn't, I didn't put the rates here, but if you, you look at the increase rates in, in, in trade measured by this index, um, there's a sharp increase after 2001. So the growth rate, the growth rate of exchanges increases a lot after 2001. So we say that that's a new, a new phase globalization, with, especially with the entry of China into WTO, which changed a lot of these equilibrium. And then, of course, we have 2008. You see a stop, sudden stop, and um, sudden stop in, in exchanges, which is then soon recovered, okay? And then... <clears throat> now, for our course, it's important because it's exactly at this point here, around 1950, when all these things were happening, when they were setting the rules of the games, that the theoretical debate was very active, okay? Theoretical debate was very active. So we have, in, in that moment in time, most of the international trade theory, the bulk of the international trade theory developed at that time, for instance, the Shirley model, based upon the idea of comparative advantage and basically as a policy implication advocating free trade. But also at the very same time, we, you had the real beginning of development economics as a subject of studies. And development studies beginning, people dealing with development studies, ad, uh, advancing their theories, for instance, the prohibition Singer hypothesis, which we'll then explain, and dependency theory, trying to understand what was the role of the so-called late camera in this architecture and whether they could really improve their situations in, in, in such a world, okay? And they are kind of separate, intertwined but separate, also because they use different languages and different set of tools, okay? So you might have very abstract models coming from the marginal marginalist revolution kind of approach. And at the same time, you have development studies which still keep some part of political economy inside, okay? Political economy inside. They are intertwined, but and around the 50s, most of them were developed and are still very much um, influential today. So 
when you think about it, the, the, the debate is still alive, even about protectionism. You know that we live in a, in a phase where apparently now protectionism is, has become a viable policy program. And, uh, but there are a lot of theories that might have a lot to say about protectionism in this phase and what would be the consequences for the US, what would be the consequences for China. Can they really engage into uh, that sort of policy and what are the consequences for Europe? And under what circumstances protectionism work? Okay, so we will come to that for sure. Questions, <coughs> issues? Okay, you are with me still? Yes, all of you. Wow, good. Okay, we can stop. I, I, I'm going to take some time here to deal with um, uh, materials. Anything you might want to ask me? These things are going to be on the Moodle platform. Okay from this afternoon, and then we will start from here tomorrow, okay? Thanks. Bye.